What makes a fish different from a salamander? What makes one kind of plant different from another kind of plant? How is one type of microorganism differentiated from another type of microorganism? What makes this bird an egret and this bird a swan? How many kinds of birds are there? These are not easy questions to answer. For centuries, scientists have struggled to name, categorize, and classify the wide variety of living things found on our planet. During the next few minutes, we're going to discuss some of the ways scientists have classified life over time. And we're going to explore how scientists classify living things today. You decide. How would you group these pieces of sporting equipment? One way to group these pieces of equipment is by color, putting all the objects of similar color together. Another way to group the objects could be based on the materials from which they're made. Yet another way to group the pieces of sporting equipment could be based on their general usage. For example, all the balls and the hockey puck could be placed in the same group. Objects used to hit these things could be placed in another group. So as you can see, there are many different ways that objects as simple as sporting equipment can be grouped. Why is it useful to place objects in groups? Grouping objects makes it much easier to find them. For example, imagine how difficult it would be to find things in this store if similar products were not grouped together. Scientists such as chemists group elements together to make them easier to find and work with. Geologists classify different kinds of rocks and meteorologists classify different kinds of clouds. Scientists also group living things so they can be more easily studied. Organisms tend to be grouped based on common ancestry. Let's now take a closer look at the process by which scientists group living things. There are over two million different kinds of known living things on Earth. Species are groups of living things that are similar and able to produce similar traits in their offspring. We refer to a specific kind of living thing as a species. Classification is the process of grouping organisms based on shared ancestry. Modern classification groups organisms together which are similarly related to each other. The process of developing classification systems has been going on for centuries. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, for example, attempted to classify living things as either plant or animal. Aristotle classified animals primarily on the basis of where they lived, whether it be in the air, the land, or in the water. Aristotle's system became difficult to work with over time, however. Scientists discovered thousands of new organisms, and they learned a lot more about living things. This necessitated a better system of classification. For example, even though dolphins and trout both live in the water, they're quite different from each other. You compare. How are dolphins and trout different? One major difference is that dolphins are mammals and trout are fish. As time progressed, scientists developed new ways of classifying organisms, which dealt with the ever-growing number of known living things. By the 17th century, Scientists began using the structural features of organisms for classification. In the 1750s, the Swedish scientist 
Carolus Linnaeus built on the work of other scientists to develop the basis for the modern day system of classification. Let's take a closer look at this system. The classification system, originally developed by Linnaeus, which is still used today, consists of a system of groups called taxa. Each taxon is a category into which related living things are placed. Taxa are placed in a hierarchy ranging from broad general categories to narrow, small, specific categories. Let's look at an example of the house cat. It's in the broad category of animals, which includes a wide range of other animals such as frogs, clams, worms, and even humans. Getting more specific, the house cat is in a category called chordates, which are animals that have backbones, including fish, birds, and salamanders. And it's in a yet smaller, more specific category called mammals, which are animals that have fur and tend to bear live young. Each category gets more specific until the final category, called Sylvestris, which is the house cat. The naming system developed by Linnaeus is based on a living thing having two names. This is referred to as binomial nomenclature. Using the process of binomial nomenclature, a living thing has a genus name and a species name. The genus refers to a broader group of living things, and the species name identifies the specific type of organism. For example, the honeybee has the genus name Apis. There are other types of bees in this genus. The honeybee has the species name Mellifera. Only the honeybee has the name Apis mellifera. If these words sound unfamiliar to you, it's because they're in Latin. Scientists commonly use Latin to name living things. This sugar maple tree has the genus name Acer and the species name Saccharum. And this bighorn sheep has the genus name Ovis and the species name Canadensis. This two-part name of an organism forms its scientific name. Just like you have a first name and a last name to specifically identify you, a scientific name helps scientists name an organism more specifically than its common name. For example, this blue-colored bird is referred to by several different names, including blue jay, blue coat, nest robber, and corn thief. You decide. What's the problem with the common name? Common names make it unclear what bird we're talking about because other birds may go by these names as well. But its scientific name, Cyanocida cristata, makes it quite clear what bird we're talking about. As you can imagine, it's a very difficult task classifying the millions of different kinds of living things found on our planet. Taxonomists are scientists responsible for classifying living things. What principles guide them in their work? The theory of evolution serves as a basis of modern scientific taxonomy. Similarities between different types of living things are used to identify evolutionary relationships between species. Scientists generally believe that the more similarities that exist between organisms, the closer their evolutionary relationship. Other types of information may also help classify organisms. One of the most common characteristics that scientists use to classify living things is related to their physical appearance. Skeletal structure, body shape, size, and anatomy all aid taxonomists in classifying organisms. 
Biochemical information also helps in the classification process. Through studying DNA and proteins, relationships between different species can be established. One very important aspect of science which greatly helps in classification is embryology. Embryology is the study of the development of embryos. By comparing the embryological development of organisms, scientists can identify relationships between different kinds of organisms. Sometimes behavior of different living things is quite helpful in distinguishing one species from another. These are just a few examples of the tools taxonomists use in the process of classification. As we briefly mentioned earlier, there are several classification categories ranging from broad to specific. In total, there are seven categories in the modern classification system. The broadest category is the kingdom, then phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Species is the most specific category. Let's see how the common housefly is classified. Going from broad to specific, it's in the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Arthropoda, the class Insecta, the order Diptera, the family Muscidae, genus Musca, and species Domestica. Let's now take a quick look at the major kingdoms. You decide. What do the following living things have in common? This worm, this marmot, and this starfish. That's right, they're all members of the animal kingdom. As we mentioned, the kingdom is the largest and most general category. The number of kingdoms is somewhat an issue of debate among taxonomists. For example, some taxonomists break the kingdom Monera into two separate kingdoms. Monerans, commonly known as bacteria, are the simplest life forms. Bacteria are microscopic organisms consisting of a single cell. Their hereditary material is not enclosed in a nucleus, as in more advanced unicellular organisms. While some consider Monerans a single kingdom, others break it into two separate kingdoms. The group of bacteria called Archaebacteria live in extreme environments, such as in hot geothermal springs, in very salty seas, or in the mud of marshes or swamps. Archaebacteria have specific characteristics which make them different from the other kingdom of bacteria called eubacteria. Eubacteria possess a substance in their cell walls which archaebacteria do not have. Another kingdom of mostly microscopic organisms are the protists. Protists are so diverse and they evolved from such a wide variety of different ancestors that scientists are at times confused on how to classify them. It's likely that as more information becomes available, this kingdom will be further divided into several kingdoms. Most protists are unicellular, although some may be simple multicellular organisms. Protists possess a nucleus which contains hereditary material. Organisms such as paramecium and amoebas are examples of protists. Plant-like protists called algae are also in this kingdom. The kingdom fungi includes yeasts, molds, and mushrooms, to name just a few. Most fungi are multicellular. They obtain their energy by decomposing once living things, or they exist as parasites on living things. Unlike plants, they cannot synthesize their own food. 
Members of the kingdom plantae can, however, create their own food via the process of photosynthesis. Members of this kingdom include mosses, liverworts, ferns, and seed plants. Plants cannot move from place to place on their own. Most members of the kingdom animalia can, however, move from place to place. Humans are a member of the animal kingdom. During the past few minutes, we've explored the fascinating process of the classification of living things. We discussed the importance and value of living things, and we explored the history of those who contributed to the process of classification, including Aristotle and Carolus Linnaeus. There are seven major taxa in the modern classification system, from kingdom to species. Using the process of binomial nomenclature, we saw how each living thing is given a specific name, which includes a genus name and a species name. We briefly discussed some of the means by which taxonomists classify organisms, including physical appearance, biochemical information, embryology, and behavior. Finally, we briefly went through the major kingdoms and highlighted some of the common organisms found in them. So the next time you look up the name of a plant or a bird in a book, or you simply admire the living things near your home, think about some of the things we've discussed during the past few minutes. You just might look at the process of classifying life a little differently. Fill in the correct word to complete the sentence. Good luck, and let's get started. Number one. Is the process of grouping things based on shared ancestry? Number two. Scientists classify living things so they can be easier to Number three, Carolus is the developer of the modern classification system. Number four, the classification system consists of several groups called Number five, nomenclature is the naming system in which an organism has two names. Number six, Acer saccharum is this tree's name. Number seven, the theory of serves as the basis for modern taxonomy. Number eight, classification is often based on the appearance of an organism. Number nine, organisms that evolve from a common are grouped together.
and number 10. There are a total of categories in the modern classification system.